Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. On our show today, all the way from beautiful, and I can say that because I've been there and spent some time in that wonderful country, Stockholm, Sweden, we have Ola Sars, who is the CEO of Soundtrack. They're the world's fastest growing music platform for B2B. I did some research, looked on your guys' website, especially in this climate, when it's regarding what we're all dealing with in the music industry with everything shut down. You guys are really offering a really cool brand. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's 10 o'clock at night there. It's three o'clock in the afternoon here. I appreciate you staying up this late. You actually were the co-founder and COO of Beats Music, which, as everyone knows, was acquired by Apple Music. And then you were the co-founder of Pacemaker, the world's first DJ-driven music platform. What was the creation of Soundtrack all about? How did that idea come up? I think the funny thing is that I've been going at this ambition to unlock value in music and trying to make it in the in the music streaming transition for more than 10 years. I'm kind of a senior citizen in, in, the, in the industry, so to speak. It's actually my fourth music startup. And all of them have been going for the same thing. I'm still working on the same idea. And that idea has sprung out of 12 years ago when I was moving away from a career in a completely different industry and, and trying to make it into music out of pure passion and make a living in music. The industry was changing right in front of me. I was hanging out with a lot of people that were working in the music industry, artists and executives and so forth. We were actually in Spain and an island called Ibiza. We were having a long discussion with some guys from the Swedish House Mafia and a couple of guys from Universal. And I was just realizing that these people are actually working with their passion and making a living in, in the music industry. So I should also do that. And, and that led to the kind of the intellectual idea of if the market is changing and digitizing in terms of consumption, distribution and production at the same time, obviously there's something big going on and there, there will be an opportunity to make a living in, in that moving forward into that future. And I took a bet and, and started my first company, Tonium Pacemaker, in that space. And what I did there, I'm still doing. And, and that's trying to figure out the curation dilemma or the quest for delivering the right music to the right context in the right time in the right place in the world. So people call it curation. Some people call it music intelligence, AI platforms or whatnot. But it's trying to find that amazing experience for that specific context. And soundtrack to your question, I'm trying to do that for the brands and the businesses of the world, uh, as opposed to previously at Beats and my previous startups for the consumer. So the right music for a specific brand or a commercial context or a, a public context at the right time can create an amazing experience in that environment. So that's what I'm trying to do right now with Soundtrack. And of course, you say you're old school. I'm going to say I'm older school because <laughs> I remember in the early days we had Muzak. When you talk B2B, you have music placement. Uh, that's what it was. And, you know, my dad had it in his office. And of course, we called it elevator music. Uh, this is a little different than that, though, right? This is more advanced. Right. So what it is, it's theoretically not that advanced. So I spent a lot of time in the consumer space understanding the streaming model and how that worked. And you may think what you think about the streaming model. I tend to like it because it took transparency into the music industry and it has an ambition to compensate the creators when people are using their art. 
So I like the thesis of it and I like the transparency of it and I like the flow through of royalties from, from the consumers to the, to the artists. So what I realized was that when I was moving back to Sweden from kind of my Beats adventure, I realized that the B2B music market, meaning background music or music as you referred to, had not gone through the same transition as the consumer market. So I thought I'd give that a shot, take the B2B legacy kind of background music, music market into the streaming era with the transparency from the model. But the beauty of it was that I could actually contribute to the market by increasing value in music because businesses are prepared to pay more. And you could unlock value for brands with music because they sell more coffee with beautiful music. So why shouldn't they be paying more? So this gave me an opportunity actually to help the industry raise value, perception of value in music and charge what I'm doing now $30 for a streaming subscription in 73 markets and kind of bringing that transparency and royalty flow through Advent even to the background music market. And that's something else when we talk about that. And, and of course, I'm going to jump on your website. When we look at the markets, the countries you're available in, I mean, it's Africa and Asia Pacific, the Caribbean, Europe, Latin America, the Middle East, and of course, North America, because we talk about Muzak, and that's really the standard bearer, at least it was back in the day. I'm a bit surprised, were you that no one had really delved into this world before you created Soundtrack? Or were there some startups that just maybe didn't get as far? Were you kind of pioneering this? I actually have to say I did. I I usually keep a low profile on, you know, statements like that because you're never really first. The reality was there's been background music for sure. And there's been a lot of innovative companies breaking into, you know, trying to create, you know, in-store experiences and so forth. But bringing the complexity of the streaming model, which I've learned the hard way is very complex. It requires tens of millions of dollars to build the actual infrastructure and technology to be able to report exactly what's being played from what publisher in that market that that songwriter is licensed on on what deal and what artist is licensed in that market and in the different markets where the music even, and flow through of that royalty to the right people based on exact right of playbacks. That's a very complex and complicated machine. And then obviously doing 9,000 licensing deals, which we've done, we're the first company who has gone out and done direct deals with publishers and labels. In the more historical format of background music, the providers have done deals with the local societies, right? So you would do sound exchange, ask at BMI in the US, in best case. But we're the first company, the pioneering company of actually doing direct licensing, hence getting the updates of metadata, millions of them every week to know that we're right in kind of consuming the catalog. We have 50 million tracks, by the way. So we're on par with Apple Music and Spotify through 9,000 deals with publishers and labels. And we have the commercials in place through those deals to flow through royalties on our subscriptions. So yes, we are pioneering the fact we have a full-on streaming model with reconciliation reporting according to that model in the B2B space. And we have the real-time system to kind of provide real-time musical experience based on AI and data. So if it's raining out, we might change. Or if, if one store needs to, you know, go more 128 BPM da- dance music, they can do that in real time and so forth. So we are pioneering in that sense. We're not the first provider of background music for sure in the world, but we are the provider of the streaming model and background music. You brought up something interesting. I was in the grocery store the other day. Typically, the background music in grocery stores, it's its really almost a pink noise or it's just a, a subtlety. And it was a grocery store, as I said. I don't know who was controlling it. It was urban music. It was hip hop. And it was loud in a grocery store. And I'm thinking mm. somebody's got their pedal to the metal on this one. So do you really structure the music for a particular store? Because I'm not sure if really that fit for that particular retailer, considering that most of the people in there were my age and, and not young. And the other thing is, you talk about this on your website, then you also have the content and filtering out some of the explicit nature, which you, you need to remove in a family environment. You're head on. The interesting thing when I moved into this was that it was so, so different to the consumer market. I mean, playing music in a public domain is very challenging. 
uh, the, the whole intellectual and technological challenge was completely different than building a consumer service like Spotify or Apple Music. Because just as you mentioned, first of all, you need to help the brand understand what their music profile is. So what's my brand in, in the world of music? And how can I augment my brand experience and the connection with my consumers with music, right? That's what everyone tried. The small restaurant entrepreneur or the Starbucks of the world. And then obviously, if you're a chain, let's just play with the idea that you're Joan the Juice, which is a Danish juice chain, but they're now at thousand juice bars. They put music first. They have a very complex idea of identifying through our machine learning methods, their brand sound. So the taste profile of their brand, how does that sound? And then they apply that you know, music DNA in different ways, depending if this if the juice store is in Stockholm, Nashville, Chicago, Munich, Madrid, or whatnot. And if it's in, on a high street, if it's lunchtime, or if it's evening, or if they're trying to sell X, Y, Z. So it's a very sophisticated distribution system, a brand experience through music. And the beauty of that is, that if you if you get this right, which some companies do, you create a, amazing experiences. So you can actually drive sales. So we've done some very sophisticated research together with some big chain, global change. One a hamburger chain based in Chicago, which is a U.S. brand, which I can't mention, but it's a very big one. And we actually proved nine percent effect on top line sales by applying our model with music, having people stay longer, buying more desserts and so forth. So all of a sudden, it's not just like, give me some music and let some guy, you know, play random urban music in my in my grocery store. It's like, let's think about this from a business perspective. And then all of a sudden that unlocks value in this art and I can charge more and I can pay the artist more. I think that's a very nice synergy that my company strives to unlock. We'll take that one step further. I used to have meetings in Panera Bread Company here in Nashville. It was just kind of a great place to meet. And during the day, I think I've got this correct, during the day they would play classical music or in the mornings. And in the afternoons into the early evenings, they would play jazz. But everything was designed to kind of really set the ambiance and the mood. You're right. If the setting is comfortable and it's warm, uh, you're going to stay longer. You're going to purchase more product. That's really kind of what this goal is, or at least part of it, right? It is because then it allows me to charge more for music. And that enables me to pay an artist through the label flow through six times more, perhaps, than for a consumer account. And that's a really good thing for the industry. Now, even more so, right? But in general, it takes us in the direction from just, you know, giving away all the music in the world for five bucks, which we're doing on the consumer side, it, which is I think it's great that we got this model. But I think we should all strive to increase value rather than, you know, deflate value. And here it is an opportunity. It's a multi-billion dollar opportunity and it's incremental for the music industry. And it's right in front of us. Why not fix it and monetize it so the songwriter in Nashville can pay her rent? We're going to take a break, get a word in for our sponsor. And when we come back, we're going to let's start talking about the artist and what's in it for them with regards to royalties, especially in this challenging time that we're all living in right now. On the show with us today, Ola Sars, who is the founder and CEO of Soundtrack. Hey, it's Laura Clapp Davidson with Shore, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. 
Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio from Stockholm, Sweden. I'm not from Stockholm, Sweden. I'm in Nashville, but Ola Sars is from Stockholm, is in Stockholm, I should say, today. The CEO of Soundtrack. Before the break, we touched on it briefly. The artist, and you and I talked about this for a minute before the show started, and we say it over and over and over. It's extremely tough times. You know, artists are struggling, whether they're a major artist or an independent artist, and we're all looking for revenue streams this is a revenue stream that artists probably haven't thought about right most likely no because also i want to be a little bit tough on us in the industry and say this value chain or the flow through has been broken i think actually i would dare say dysfunctional because if an artist or a songwriter's art is being played in through one of the old solutions of background music as an artist they will, to 99.99%, not receive one dime in royalties because the royalties stop somewhere else. And I won't point any fingers or anything. I'll just conclude the fact that there is not a fair flow through and a fair compensation of royalties for music being used in businesses today. I want to fix that. And I want to increase the royalties as well in terms of the flow through to the artist when their art is used to sell more coffee. So, yes, they should be looking at their royalty statements and they should be looking for all the big brands of background music supply and see where the royalties are coming through because they should be getting paid. Does this work as a monthly statement or a quarterly statement or as a per play? How is that revenue stream? How is that shown to the owner of that song? Exactly the same way as through Spotify or Apple Music. So the way that you are presented your royalties from Spotify, you should also look for, okay, where's my B2B revenues? Like where are, where's my music from, where's my royalty from Mood Media, from Play Network, from Image Sound, Soundtrack, the suppliers in the B2B space. I think there should be a requirement that that royalty statement should include if their music is used. Does that revenue stream, is it something that is noticeable? Because at least here in the United States, when we talk about Spotify and what the artist receives, it's, you know, it's minuscule. How is that in relation to the revenue stream they could see from B2B? Well, uh, let's just say that I'm trying to charge as much as possible from the buyer of the subscription, the business in this case. And I'm currently at $30 $30 per store per month, the subscription. Hence, I will be distributing through almost six times more royalties to the label or to the publisher than through a consumer subscription. Having said that, obviously, my volume we've just rolling out is not big. The business market is not as big as the consumer market. But the theory is the same. The model is the same. We have a pro rata or usage-based distribution. So we, we collect all the revenue from our B2B customers, and then we distribute a big proportion of those $30 or $40 subscriptions, actually, in some markets, based on how what music is being consumed. So just this week, I got hit up by a couple of indie artists on, on LinkedIn and so forth. So I'm starting to see my royalties flow through now. It's the first time I've seen <laughs> royalties from B2B. And I think that was a great day. It's not, you know, it might buy them a dinner, but I mean, we're getting there and I'm just starting. So I think it's super important that we we flow through from those 30 or $40. But right now we're very early, so it's not going to pay the rent yet. But hopefully we'll get there. You just mentioned you heard from some indie artists. So this is something that is available to the indie artist along with the artist who has a publishing deal or is signed to a label, right? Right. So we have deals with all the major indie labels, Merlin, the Merlin Network, Amuse, and all those guys, as well as, you know, we have 9,000 publishers assigned as well. So we're really trying to get the, the full market coverage and 
the correct data and reporting and reconciliation flow for every little song that's being played. With everything that's going on in the world right now, the shutdowns, are these brick-and-mortar retailers, is this something that's in their budget? Is this something that they still consider as part of their package of doing business, is, is having this in place, this music? I would say that it's, it's a very challenging market right now, for sure for that. So I think it's it's not probably not the best time to go out on on the defense screaming that, you know, retailers should be paying. I mean, everyone's fighting through this, but I think if you're up and running and if you're using music to run your business, you sh- we've been doing covid discounts and really trying to work with everyone, but at least you should think about, you know, paying for it as well, right? But let's think about a normal market. You know, all hope we get back to some type of normality and we're back in business and where the restaurants are open, which they are in Stockholm, by the way. So we're basically more or less back on, on normal procedures here. I think we should be much tougher. There's a lot of people using consumer accounts. So we actually did a deep dive together with Nielsen Music Research last year. And we could conclude that there's around 20 million businesses in Western markets, including North America and Europe, that are using either Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, or consumer accounts. And that's, you know, from an IT perspective, the equivalent of opening a cinema on your Netflix account, right? That doesn't fly. And that's not cool, you know? And it's not like if you run a sports bar and you're running, you know, NBA or NFL, you're damn sure you're going to have a business subscription, right? Because because I don't know, is it, is it Fox in the U.S.? I can't remember. Yeah. But is, in, yeah. In, so, you know, that's a major income area for them because they're filling the bar. So, of course, the bar owner is happy to pay for it. It's the same in music. If you don't want music, don't play it if you don't want to pay for it. If you're using it to drive the ambience and create a great experience, then $30 isn't a lot. I mean, come on. And so it really comes down to a little bit of, I I think, enforcement might be a a too harsh of a word, but it's really an administration or a governing to ensure that these businesses understand that this is a value added that they're ultimately providing to their consumers. And because it's a value added, it has some worth to it. So I guess for you, it's a bit of an education process to them. I usually speak about it as the stick in the carrot you guys use, right, as an expression. And I think my job is to build a carrot, right? Like like Spotify did, and I, I actually think Spotify did a good job for the industry, and people might think differently, but I actually think it was a good job because they provided a solution that was better than piracy. And their strategy in the beginning was better than piracy. And I think that's my job and Soundtrack's job to create a better than piracy B2B music subscription service where – you get invoicing, you can control multiple restaurants, you can use our AI to create the brand experience, You all the benefits, you can remove explicit lyrics and you can schedule your music over a work week, everything that's kind of the tools for a business. Then if we become better than piracy, that actually in this instance, it might sound about here are the consumer services, most of it. Then we can start moving up people to actually paying properly for a business subscription. And hence, we unlock lots of value in the market, a significant increase in royalty flow through. We're going to take another break, get another word in for another one of our sponsors. Hi, this is Karina Rose Logston with High Fidelity, and I'm sitting here with my pal Bob Bender sharing my expertise and wisdom here on the business side of music. Stay tuned. You're listening to the business side of music. Hey, it's Chris SD from Sync Songwriter. Imagine what it would be like getting your music into the latest TV shows, movies, or ads. Your songs would not only get exposure in front of millions of viewers, you'd get paid to do it and gain a reputation as the songwriter that you are. I've been showing songwriters, composers, and artists how to get their music into TV and film for over 15 years. Collectively, they have generated hundreds of thousands of dollars from licensing their music. Their music has been on networks such as HBO, Bravo, ABC, NBC, Netflix, and more. In films or trailers, such as Predator, Annihilation, Christmas Chronicles, Professor Mac, and many others. So many songwriters upload their music to websites hoping to get discovered. Unfortunately, this almost never happens with the millions of songs out there competing for attention. I show you how to get your music heard by the people who can actually make it happen for you. When you start getting your music licensed, you automatically develop a reputation in the industry. 
This lets you get syncs over and over again. If you'd like to discover how to connect with the right people in music licensing, just click the Sync Songwriter logo on the Business Side of Music webpage, and I'll see you there. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Ola Sars is the CEO of Soundtrack. Yeah, I think... I think the fun thing is that if you look at kind of the opportunity in the market and once again, back to the harsh reality of where we're living now in the industry, it's like we're looking for low hanging fruit, right? We're looking for something to kind of make up the missing live scene and so forth. And I think this is such a no brainer for the industry to go after and work together as a team of actually seeing that we get this model functioning out in we provide today this the equivalent catalog in 73 markets of Spotify. There's no reason to use Apple Music or something. We should all, the societies should get engaged, the, the local societies, the industry the organs that are active, people like us who are speaking to the industry. We should all get behind the notion that, look, let's just fix this. And that's a low hanging fruit and we can you know earn some more from our art. Actually, we, we quantified the royalty dealt the last year with Nielsen. It's, it's $2.3 $2. billion in missing out royalties every year because we have this, these 20 million consumer accounts. Being used. We should just fix that, right? Not talk about the next TikTok or something. Right here, just fix it and, and we can increase the value. So I think that's kind of my point and the logic to the industry of working together. And I'm not saying I'm going to be the only – Beneficiary. I think I'm I'm kind of pioneering into this and changing it and and welcoming you know a bigger market to grow because that will benefit all of us. So I think that's a very important part of of what I'm doing. Then obviously it's it's a really fun space. I mean music is, is amazing. It can make people fall in love, buy another beer, or cry or dance. And in the public context, it's just become you know we all can relate to it so easily. It's if if the music is great, the experience is great. I think you've just really put your finger on the pulse of it. If the music is great. Now, with that being said, what is your criteria for an artist to, I'm focusing mostly on the independent artists, but maybe the label acts or, or publishers out there listening. What is your criteria for music? Is there something you won't take over something that you would, or uh, what are those parameters? Absolutely not. We are not the judge at that at all. The, our customers are. So if our customers want to play Rammstein over and over again and think that's the right thing for their brand experience, go ahead. I am the, I am the facilitator of that interchange between Rammstein and that brand. But we do put a lot of technology and effort into a very specific music intelligence platform and an AI platform that helps a brand quickly create a brand sound. So on our platform, for example, if you're running that cafe, you can go in and you can you can feed in metadata like elegant house music and jazz and soul from the 60s and 70s with low energy without explicit lyrics. We create a soundtrack based on that and it lives forever and you can go and sell coffee and when you retire, you can cancel the service. So you drill down that deep. Yes, we've added an additional 20 dimensions on music analysis, on music based on brand, how brands think about it. So we have very advanced machines uh, analyzing music every day. So we're reanalyzing the, the, all the music in the world based on a brand filter and a brand perspective. And I would think that, say, one retailer, maybe it's Ikea, uh, would be different than, say, Macy's or Aldi's or, or whatever that brand is. Do you know going into those retailers what it is they're looking for? Or do they give you a certain amount of input when it comes to creating what that playlist is going to be? For sure. I think sophisticated brands like that have a brand strategy. They have a tactical brand plan. So kind of adopting the experiences from store to store. And they can easily interpret that brand strategy into music by inputting it into our machines. Usually those brand strategies are, are defined through like brand positioning statements that sound like we are elegant and our target group is 25, 35 year olds. And we are energetic, elegant soulful maybe and we want to meet that type of thinking in terms of the, providing that brand dna and music so others might actually hire curators human curators as well that do like you know white glove treatment and they can do that on our platform as well they, they can use different levels of sophistication and human involvement all the way to letting our machines do the whole job for them 
What do you mean by white glove treatment? Meaning that you have a concierge working in our system and just picking, you know, specific. Actually, some customers do that. They have people who are, you know, 24 hour curators for their restaurants and they pick every track and then they can do that in our admin system and kind of move those through the work week in, in a very kind of human driven way. But our AI platform offers the opportunity to use machines to do it as well. It's all it's all a question of preference. How does the artist, publisher, record label, how do they submit the music to you for your uh, approval? You just have to do a deal with us. So ask if you're an artist, ask your label, do you have a deal with soundtrack? If you're a songwriter, ask your publisher, do you have a deal with soundtrack? It's as easy as that. And if they're an independent artist, that it's just they can reach out to you directly? They could go to us directly or go, go through a Muse or any of the kind of independent kind of uh, aggregator platforms, which deals with. How can people find you? <laughs> well, SoundtrackYourBrand.com or Soundtrack.fm. You can email me for questions, Ola, at SoundtrackYourBrand.com. I, I try to answer everyone's questions. I have long work weeks. Ola, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me and an amazing, amazing show. So it's, it's, a good, it's a good format for sure. Thank you. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Bison. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go. Good looking, we'll be back to pick you up later.